My name is Mark Koenig. I'm the co-chair of the Israel-Palestine working group of NGOs here in the UN community. We are honored to sponsor this event. But to do a full justice of an introduction, I'm going to introduce the publisher of Just World Books, uh, Helena Coban, and uh, allow her to introduce us to Gareth. Hi. Thanks, everybody, for turning out. Um, Gareth Porter is known to many people as a feisty, independent, investigative journalist and historian. This book, as you will learn from Gareth, really reveals the degree to which the warmongering party here in the United States has constructed, has manufactured, has fabricated an entire set of accusations against Iran and then use those accusations both to whip up anti-Iran sentiment in this country and to force the United Nations to raise its level of, of sanctions and antipathy toward Iran. So, Gareth, thank you for everything you've done in a long career. Thank you very much. This, uh, this book may not get any... Uh, Pulitzer Prize, but I do think that it does deserve a prize for timeliness, uh, given the fact that today, February uh, 18th, 2014, of course, is the date on which the crucial phase of the nuclear negotiations between the United States and its five other negotiating partners on one side and Iran on the other side begin uh, in uh, Vienna. Uh, the crucial and uh, fateful uh, set of negotiations, which uh, we don't know how long they'll take, and we, we really don't know what the outcome of those talks will be. And I, and I have to say, in all honesty, at the outset, that uh, I am much less optimistic, I think, than Helena is, by perhaps by my, uh, not, not by my nature, but by my training as a student of international politics going all the way back to studying under Hans Morgenthau, the great uh, uh, the, the, uh, scholar who was identified with the uh, real politic in, uh, in American scholarship on international politics, but also having lived through so many wars now, beginning with Vietnam, uh, and, and believing after the Vietnam War ended that the United States, of course, will learn its lesson from this disaster and this kind of thing will not happen again. Well, of course, I was profoundly, deeply wrong. And that's part of the reason why, uh, as a result particularly of my writing the previous book that Helena referred to, Perils of Dominance, Imbalance of Power and the Road to War in Vietnam, I began to see something that I had missed earlier in my life, which was that it's not just a problem of this president or that president. It's not LBJ or George Bush. It's a system that is deeply entrenched in this country that has amassed uh, and, and began to amass enormous power uh, to maintain the level of uh, war preparations and, and ability to make war that it began to uh, have early in the Cold War. And uh, I don't really get into that very much in the book, but, but there is a link to this uh, phenomenon uh, in the story of U.S. policy toward Iran if you go back to the early 1990s. And I want to touch on that a little bit later uh, in my remarks. Uh, as, as Helena has said uh, very, very accurately, the, uh, the problem that uh, has surrounded the question of U.S. and international policy toward Iran's nuclear program is one of misinformation and disinformation. All of you here have followed the news media for many years about this issue or you wouldn't be here. So you know from reading 
the news media that uh, when Iran's first enrichment facility was discovered in 2002, was made public by a group called the Mujahideen Calc, or the, their, pu their public face, the National Council uh, on Resistance of Resistance in Iran, uh, that, uh, that the Iranians were hiding this facility because uh, they secretly were working on nuclear weapons and it had been discovered and, and they had been outed. Uh, you know that uh, Iran was found to have had a nuclear weapons program from 2001 to 2003 because there were all these documents that uh, were turned over to Western intelligence in 2004 and then given to the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, and for many years made public through the IAEA uh, uh, quarterly reports year after year from 2006 through 2013, 2014. The, these documents have been referred to in one way or, or another, and they reveal uh, the fact, quote unquote, that Iran was indeed working on, uh, covertly working on nuclear weapons. Um, and indeed, uh, the IAEA, you know from reading the press, has told us in 2011 that there's even more documentary evidence and evidence from intelligence from uh, more than one country that the uh, Iranians have continued to work on nuclear weapons as late as 2007, not necessarily limited to 2007. So you know all those things. Unfortunately, what you know from reading the news media is almost entirely false. All of, all of the things that I've just said are absolutely false, and I've documented that in such detail in this book that it really is only for wonks. <laughs> uh, it, it is so, this is, this is a challenging book. It is not light reading, it's not entertaining reading. So uh, sort of uh, consumer warning, uh, but I don't think that this is a problem for anyone who's here. <laughs> I don't think anybody who is here is going to be uh, certainly uh, bothered by the fact that it is detailed uh, and, and indeed... And it has footnotes. It does have footnotes. Uh, for better or for worse, uh, in terms of the reader, uh, reader's interest in footnotes, but no, I mean, seriously, uh, this book does, uh, does tell you uh, in, in very uh, deep detail how these uh, falsehoods uh, were constructed. And what I'd like to do uh, is not go back to the beginning of the story uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, but rather come to what I think is a crucial turning point in the story of the construction of what I called what, I, what I've called in the book, Manufactured Crisis. And that is uh, what happened in 2004 when uh, these documents were turned over to Western intelligence. Uh, I was able, uh, as a result of um, having followed this story for several years, beginning uh, around 2006, I began to write stories about the Iranian nuclear program, uh, the, the nuclear issue in Iran. And, and I have to tell you, just as a very quick aside, that I was fooled like everybody else when I began to write about this. I believed, in fact, in 2006, when I began to write about this uh, issue, that Iran, of course, was interested in nuclear weapons. They were trying, they had tried to pursue nuclear weapons. And the reason was that they were afraid of the United States and Israel and they had uh, every reason to, to seriously uh, think about nuclear weapons and, and to work on them. Um, and it was only at, at a certain point in, two th in, in late 2007 when uh, I got a source, a German source, close to the foreign minister uh, and the chancellor of Germany at that time, who told me face to face that those documents did in fact come from the resistance organization in Iran, meaning the Mujahideen i Kalk. Mujahideen i Kalk, of course, is a terrorist organization. It was officially listed as a terrorist organization by the U.S. State Department for many years. 
uh, because of its uh, having not only killed uh, six American officials or civilians uh, in the 1970s when it was you know, located in Iran, uh, and it also blew up, exploded terrorist bombs and killed and maimed civilians uh, who were attending government rallies or government meetings in Iran after the Islamic Revolution and the, uh, the beginning of the Islamic Republic of Iran. So very good reason for this organization to have been listed as a terrorist organization. So that began my, uh, the start of my intense interest in trying to figure out what actually happened in regard to this issue. I knew there was something wrong here, and I began to investigate more deeply. And uh, as a result of that, uh, that source, I have tried to find confirmation ever since then. Um, and in the book, I have new information, never previously published, based on an interview with a, f a high rank former high-ranking German foreign office official named Karsten Voigt. Karsten Voigt at one time was the spokesperson in the German parliament for the SPD, the Social Democratic Party of Germany. He was, because of that, he was named to a high-ranking position in the foreign, officer, foreign office. He was the coordinator of North American German relations beginning in 1997 or 1998, I guess it was. Uh, and held that position for his entire foreign office career until he retired in 2010. Last March, I interviewed him by phone, and he gave me the full story of what happened on these documents. He told me that in, 2000, uh, in November 2004, after Colin Powell had made a public statement seemingly off the cuff to reporters who were accompanying him on a trip to Latin America, about Iran working very hard on mating their longer range missile to a weapon, as he called it, clearly implying a nuclear weapon, and everybody, all the press understood that that's what he was saying. And that, of course, generated a major press round of stories uh, to that effect. Well, immediately after that, he got a call from his friends at the BND. Uh, the Bundesnachrichtendienst, I believe is the way you pronounce it, the German F Foreign Intelligence Agency. They were quite upset by Colin Powell's remarks, and they wanted to talk to him about it, and they told him that they knew all about the documents that he was, Colin Powell was referring to, because they were documents that had come from one of their sources, one of their intelligence sources, not a spy, not somebody who was hired by the BND to be a spy, but one of their occasional sources that they talked to. They knew that the source was, in fact, a member of the Mujahideen i Kalk, and they also knew that they did not trust the source. They did not trust the Mujahideen i Kalk from their experience, and they did not trust the source. As Karsten Voigt told me, they believed the source was doubtful, quote unquote. And so Karsten Voigt was being uh, told that they were quite worried that the Bush administration was going to repeat history. Why did they say that? Because Curveball was a BND source as well. Curveball, of course, was the Iraqi exile in Germany who had told tales of Iraqi bio, mobile bioweapons labs, which later became the centerpiece of Secretary of State Colin Powell's presentation to the United right Nations, here. right here across the street, which was so crucial to generating support, turning uh, public opinion in the United States around for supporting a war against the Saddam uh, Hussein regime. And so uh, what the BND senior officials he spoke with were afraid of was that now the Bush administration had decided to do the same thing 
on Iran. They were afraid that they were going to cite this source, who they believed was not credible, uh, as the basis for building a case to attack Iran. Uh, and so, although Carson Voigt told me they did not explicitly say to him, we want you to warn the Americans, he understood that that's what they were talking about uh, because of his position. And a few days later, very few days later, a story appeared in the Wall Street Journal which quoted Karsten Voigt by name saying that the United States should not base its policy on single source headlines. That was the way the Wall Street Journal characterized his statement. Um, and that uh, the, the papers that he was citing, the documents he was citing, came from a dissident, an Iranian dissident group. He, it was not named specifically. That obviously was his way of warning the U.S. government. Now, I have not been able to confirm or, or to disconfirm whether the uh, BND also contacted high-ranking officials of the CIA, presumably the director of the CIA at that time, and warned once again, do not rely on this source quite explicitly. I have reason to believe that that was probably the case, uh, given the fact that uh, August Hanning, uh, who was the head of, of the BND during the curveball affair, did in fact send a two-page letter to George Tenet, the then director of the CIA, in December 2002, and, and said explicitly, do not, we, we do not believe that these should be relied upon. Of course, Tenet paid no attention because he was part of the problem in the Bush administration. Uh, he was part of the deal. So there's every reason to believe that Hanning, who was still the head of the BND, would have done the same thing once again. Um, but uh, even if he didn't, clearly after this warning in the Wall Street Journal, uh, which would have been passed around the State Department and the CIA, and everyone would have realized what, what this was talking about, um, th there would have been no difficulty in the CIA simply contacting the CIA station chief in Berlin and having the station chief talk with his counterpart uh, in the BND and say, what's this all about? So one way or another, we know that the high-ranking officials of the CIA knew the truth about these documents. And from then on, we know that they were lying. They were flat-out lying about these documents. There were stories floated in the news uh, media, New York Times in particular, David Sanger had an article, Sanger and Broad had, a, had an article about this, saying that uh, they understood from a former intelligence official that uh, these documents came from the purloined laptop computer of uh, an engineer or a scientist who had been working in this covert Iranian nuclear program. Uh, later on, that story was walked back by whoever does these sorts of manipulations of the press and of the IAEA and the uh, other variants began to, to come out in various places like Der Spiegel saying that no, what actually happened was that the Germans had recruited a spy who penetrated the Iranian nuclear program and was able to collect these documents and get them out of the country in one version of the story through his wife. Uh, and he, he never made it out of the country. We don't know what his fate was. Uh, all of these things, of course, were lies. They were covering up the fact that these uh, documents uh, came from a, an organization that would have been recognized by many, if not most, uh, people who were following this story as a doubtful source. Now, bear in mind that th uh, another thing to, to understand about the Mujahideen Calc is that they were really close, not to not so much uh, to U.S. intelligence, uh, although U.S. intelligence obviously had contact with them, but to the Mossad, the International Intelligence Agency of Israel. Uh, it's well documented that uh, that the 
Mossad had essentially used the MEK uh, through the NCRI, the National Council of Resistance of Iran, uh, to essentially uh, make public the existence of the Natanz uh, nuclear facility. The MEK didn't find out about it on its own. It was able to give the coordinates of the location which came, of course, from satellite photography. Well, the MEK has no satellite photography. They got it from Mossad. And this was a fact that was reported by Seymour Hirsch, that, that he got it from a senior official of the IAEA, that that was the case. Uh, it was also um, reported uh, in The New Yorker by uh, a, a correspondent who had interviewed other Iranian exile groups who said, yes, Mossad, well, they didn't name, <laughs> they didn't name the country, but they said a certain uh, country friendly to the United States had been shopping around uh, these uh, documents to various exile groups. And the person that she talked to said, we turned it down, we refused to do it. Uh, but clearly, the, uh, the MEK was happy to, uh, to do the bidding of, of Mossad on this. All of this then relates to the question of who actually fabricated these documents, because I show in the book uh, that there, there are details, there are contradictions in the or, or between material in the documents and facts which are, can be ascertained independently that show that these could not be authentic documents. And uh, I make a case based on circumstantial evidence, but I think very strong circumstantial evidence that indeed the Mossad itself fabricated these documents. It would not be, of course, surprising that that's the case uh, because we know that Mossad, in fact, had an office uh, which was devoted entirely to influencing governments and news media uh, of the rest of the world on Iran. And uh, occasionally, as part of its job, it would turn over documents that it claimed came from within Iran to governments or news media. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that that was the place where this work was done. These documents played an absolutely crucial role in the building of public opinion, uh, to uh, the building of a, of a public opinion that Iran had indeed been carrying out a covert nuclear weapons program, and even more importantly, building an international coalition behind a policy to punish Iran. Uh, and speaking of punishing Iran, uh, to go back to the, the original uh, plan of the Bush administration, when, when this manufactured crisis was first hatched between John Bolton, who was then the primary policymaker of the Bush administration on proliferation issues, WMD issues, and the Israelis, there's no doubt that uh, Dick Cheney, John Bolton, and their allies within the Bush administration, the neoconservatives, uh, had in mind the military option. They didn't know for sure that they would exercise the military option, but they were very, very serious about considering that as uh, one of the key options that they were going to be looking at in the future once, of course, they took over Iran and used it as a military base for pushing the, the uh, United States power, military power and influence throughout the rest of the region. And of course, we know that in 2007, Vice President Dick Cheney did in fact make a proposal, uh, not for a just a, an, uh, an out and out uh, attack on the Iranian nuclear program, but rather to use a future uh, attack in Iraq that could be blamed, an attack on U.S. Uh, troops in Iraq that could be blamed on Iran as an, a pretext for a U.S. retaliatory attack on Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps bases uh, in Iran, which, of course, the neoconservatives planned to use as a basis for escalating a war that would then allow them to uh, attack military targets more generally, including the nuclear program in Iran. 
Well, the Pentagon and the U.S. military squashed that very quickly. They had no intention of going to war against Iran. Uh, and that was the closest that we have come to going to war with Iran in the entire history of this very sad tale, uh, this, this sad episode in, in American foreign policy history. Uh, so the, the, the crucial role that the uh, documents played in this uh, policy, in this manufactured crisis, was to allow the IAEA, indeed to put pressure on the IAEA, to use these documents to accuse Iran of having had a, a covert nuclear weapons program uh, that would then be cited as the basis for some international action. It would be the basis for taking Iran to the United Nations Security Council, where the United States could either get support for military action, carry out military action unilaterally on the basis of the case that had been made through the IAEA, or if it turned out that it, that did not appear to be feasible or uh, an idea that, that, that was timely, they, they could organize sanctions against Iran as an intermediate, uh, intermediary step. Of course, that is finally what happened uh, in 2012, uh, that, that the United States, the, the Obama administration at that point, organized an international coalition behind uh, sanctions, what uh, Hillary Clinton called crippling sanctions against Iran. Uh, and crucially, it was an IAEA report based on more documents more, and more intelligence uh, issued in November 2011 that was supposed to set the stage for organizing that coalition. We know that the Obama administration was consciously working with the Israelis on a time frame in which the kickoff was going to be the issuance of that IAEA report of November 2011, which is still being cited now as sort of the gold standard of information about the Iranian nuclear program. The crucial thing that you need to know about the IAEA report of November 2011 is that it is almost entirely based on documents and intelligence that came from Israel. We know this from uh, Mohammed al baradai the former director general of the IAEA, in his memoirs. He talks about a whole raft of new documents that were given by Israel to the IAEA in 2009. Uh, I think he missed one important, one key uh, document that actually was given by Israel in 2008. But the key thing is that he says at that point Israel was doing so openly. They were no longer filtering the documents through a third party as they had done before. And uh, even then, the IAEA continued to conceal the fact that these documents were coming from Israel. Why? Not because it was covering, it was, it was uh, uh, keeping secret the, uh, the actual spies who got the information, uh, but rather concealing the primary political fact that this information was coming from a state which had a greater incentive, a greater political interest in blackening Iran with regard to its nuclear program than any other state in the world. And by then, uh, indeed from 2008 on, I document the fact, partly from WikiLeaks uh, cables which have been made public, that the IAEA safeguards department had become so close, so closely allied with the United States and Israel and their allies in the anti-Iran coalition in the IAEA that it, it was really an instrument of that coalition by then. It was simply, there was simply no distance between the two. They were working so closely together. Uh, so I want to just emphasize that the IAEA has played the central role in the manufactured crisis as a result of pressure from the United States, political pressure on al baradai to begin with, and essentially recruiting the safeguards department, at that point uh, led by Ali Heinonen, who has now gone on to a cushy position at Harvard University for his troubles, um, 
and uh, now his successor has continued that same relationship and has continued, uh, if anything, has gone one or two steps further uh, toward uh, constructing a false uh, history of the Iranian nuclear program. So uh, instead of going into more detail, I'll stop there. I think that gives you sort of the most dramatic evidence that I have in the book uh, and, and the evidence that I think uh, goes the farthest in uh, debunking the false history that has been put forward by the United States and its European allies as well at this point. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, I'll be happy to talk to you uh, further, answer any questions, listen to your comments. Thanks. Um, the question was um, mainly about the Ahmadinejad factor and the fact that there were other causes for um, doubt about I Iran's intentions and actions, um, certainly during the Ahmadinejad period. Uh, I have not seen any evidence that the Ahmadinejad regime or even the constituency that it represents are in favor of nuclear weapons. That is not to say, th th in favor of actually having a nuclear weapons program. That is not to say that individuals uh, in the IRGC, uh, in the Iranian military industrial complex, if you will, were not interested in doing work themselves that related to nuclear weapons. It's clear that that was the case. And indeed, I cover that point in the book. And it relates to uh, a, a key point about what was going on in Iran in the late 1990s up to 2003, uh, which, which relates to the debate uh, within Iran over its nuclear program. And the, and the question at the center of the debate was, okay, we're not going to have nuclear weapons. We're not going to have weapons of mass destruction. The Shia jurisprudence rules that out as illicit under Islam, uh, under Islam. But in the case of chemical weapons, you know, during the Iran-Iraq war, we didn't have, we didn't uh, manufacture chemical weapons, despite the fact that Iran was being attacked year after year, time after time, by the Iraqis with chemical weapons, the reason being that Khomeini said, no, this is illegal uh, in Islam. Uh, but what they did do was to try to deter the Iraqis by saying, if you keep doing this, we may be forced to change our policy. And they procured the, uh, the, the precursor chemicals, and they had a facility, but they, they never did it. So what's the equivalent of that in the case of nuclear weapons? Well, some people who had a vested interest themselves were arguing we should understand how to make a nuclear weapon uh, so that we can have a credible deterrent. And that implied that they would be allowed to do work on the subject. They would be allowed to do research. Gareth Porter, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming.